today I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Barrett Browning's How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. Probably her most famous poem. And that first line I just recited, probably one of the most famous lines of literature in all of the English language. Um, of course, I am going to be talking about this poem in terms of our assignments not just in terms of the poem. In fact, I won't spend enough time on the poem, quite frankly. I just want to focus on how you might write about this, how you would write about something like this so that you can practice for your assignments. <clears throat> Our class assignments, we have essays worth, essays one, two, and three, worth 10, 15, and 20% of your grade. Um, we do poetry analysis, three of those, which are worth 10, percent of your grade each, and then response papers and Blackboard discussions. Now, we only do four, per, four Blackboard discussions the whole semester, and we've already done one. We'll only do three more because we do those on Thursdays, and Thursdays are also the day I have you turn in your poetry analysis and your essays, so there aren't very many of them left. They're worth about 2% of your grade each. The same can be said for your response papers, but overall, what all three of these things, the poetry analysis, the response papers, and the Blackboard discussions are meant to do is to give you help toward writing the essays, right? So the poetry analysis where you dive deep into one poem and do outside research and look up outside sources telling you about information is a way for you to understand a poem more deeply so that you can write about it. And a response paper is meant to be a small version of what the essay is requiring you to do. And the Blackboard discussion will be something similar, but with feedback from your peers instead of from me. Um, these lectures, again, are, I think, pretty boring because they're all geared toward not the poetry itself, which is a much more exciting, interesting part, but toward helping you understand the assignments I'm asking you to do. So, for example, on April 7th, I will post this uh, later. This is your response paper topic, right? It is to um, take one of these poems listed here. I'll post this later. You don't have to look at this very carefully. And then write a 300-word response where you talk about, as the title of this lecture is called, the form and the symbols in one of these poems. That's what you will be doing. So that is specifically meant to help you get ready for essay two. I will also post essay two in the next week or so. Here in essay two, you'll choose a poem between these pages, right, 50 to 123, so it's the next section of poetry, and write another thousand word essay where you talk about the meaning in relationship to two poetic elements not imagery. And then there's a list of these poetic elements. And what I'll be doing over the next weeks until it is due is trying to illustrate how, what that might look like and having you practice in your response paper so that writing essay two will not be so difficult. That's what all these assignments are meant to do is to, to be a stage to getting you to be successful in your essay writing. So going back to, I should go back to form and symbols in this particular poem. So using Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem, How Do I Love Thee? One of the things that's pretty obvious in this poem, if you look at it at all, is that it is in a specific form. So that is one thing, obviously, if I were to write about this poem, I would have to talk about is the poem, form of this poem. So form, it is in a sonnet form. And sonnets are 14 lines with specific rhyme schemes. There are two main parts of them, of a, any sonnet, the octave or eight lines that follow a rhyme scheme. It usually asks a question, raises a doubt, etc. You can see this bullet here. And then it's followed by a turn, which is the sestet or the final six lines that follow a different rhyme scheme. And it tries to strike out in a new direction that will answer the question or resolve the doubt or something like that. In the case of this specific poem, in, Bar in Browning, Barrett Browning's poem, the octave represents the poet's efforts to number the ways that she loves this, the object of her passion. And then the sestet 
um, turns and talks about the previous loss of love in the past and how loss in the future is going to um, will be overcome because of her great love. Right, so this is a very specific form. So I want to talk a little bit about um, next the rhyme scheme. Um, what pattern emerges for the last words in each line, right? So in an Italian sonnet form, the octet will have this rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A. So I've listed below for you, the end of the lines are ways, height, sight, grace, right? A, ways, that's one form. Height, that does not rhyme with ways, so that's a different, that's a B. And then B, again, because sight rhymes with height, and then grace rhymes with ways. So A, B, B, A, same thing again. Days, candlelight, right, praise, right? So that's the rhyme scheme. And then the sestet runs lots of different ways. In sonnet 43, this sonnet we're talking about, it's use, faith, lose, breath, choose, death, right? So C, D, C, D, C, D. I hope you see that it has to be the letters C and D because we already use the letters A and B to describe the octet. So those are two parts of form that are very important to note. And so uh, let's move on to another form, meter and enjambment. These are other parts of form. So first of all, the meter, um, how many syllables do you have per line? Right, so in this case, this pentameter, right? We have five two syllable iambic feet, which means they have five different syllable, two syllable sections. I am is the da dum pattern, supposedly to mimic e English speech. So I give you a line here I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. So you can hear it that it's da 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 da, right? Which is exactly um, supposed to be how we speak when we speak English. And so I, I am means the da dum. And the petrometer is we have five of those two syllable feet, right? So each feet I, I love is one foot, two, the two, one foot, the depth, etc. And there's five, one, two, three, four, five of these. Um, the end of the line usually marks the end of the thought. That's what happens in sentence, uh, sonnets, sorry, not sentences. That's what I maybe was confusing myself with. But one of the things that Barrett Browning uses to such uh, effect is what is called enjambment, right? This word right here, enjambment. So that just means um, to end, to continue the line past the end of the line, continue the thought, sorry, past the end of the line. So the line would read, um, uh, I lovely to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. That's the next line after that second line. That's where the thought kind of more ends. When feeling out of sight for the ends of be being and ideal grace, right? So the line ends at sight, but it continues to go on. So the effect of this is to, you know, stop the sing-songing because da 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 all the time kind of ends up sounding sing-songy. And so that breaks it up, but it also shows that it's breaking out of conventional, uh, uh, restraints that are put on um, sonnets. So meter, rhyme, um, action, the form, the sonnet form, these are all things we note about this particular poem. But the big question is how does this contribute to the meaning? So I've identified one meaning that could possibly be here. I think it's hard to get around this meaning. It's definitely a love poem. So I said the meaning could be my love for you is stronger than anything else and will last past death. Okay, that's one sentence, a one sentence meaning. So I now I need to explain how I think the form contributes to that meaning. So let's start off with this beyond before sonnets. Let's start off with the difference between fixed and free. So the verse we're using is very fixed, meaning it has a very rigid structure. Free verse would have no. Uh, fixed structure. It would still have stanzas. It would still have lines of poetry that would look different from prose written across the page, but it has no set number of meters and no set number of lines, etc. So as Wikipedia uh, 
tells us rigid structures are a challenge to be innovative and create while staying within the guidelines. Right? So that's what fixed um, structures do, forms, fixed forms do. Most of the poetry we have read until this point has been fixed. It's very rare to have free verse. On the other hand, starting in about, gosh, I would say the late 1800s, early 1900s, and certainly today, free verse is what everyone writes in. It's really unusual. If someone's going to write in a fixed form, it's kind of as an exercise for themselves, not because they think that's the most effective way to express something. So it's very unusual. But right now, we're studying everything is kind of fixed. Um, these fixed forms give you a tight control over the topic. And in, in an essay in Poetry for Students, a, a man named, a scholar named Brent Goodman writes, traditional poetic forms help writers give shape to subjects that are otherwise difficult to manage or to get a handle on. So love, why would love be such a difficult thing to understand? Why might Barrett Browning want to use a, the sonnet? I think it's important um, to note here that the sonnet had been out of fashion by the time she was writing this poetry. Um, Shakespeare used it, Milton used it, Petrarch used it. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about below. But these were men living in the, you know, 14, 1500s, 1600s. Um, I guess Milton was a little bit later, but, you know, much, much earlier than what she is writing in the 1800s. Um, she sort of revives it. It is known as this says at the last line, sonnets are associated with love. So she's revived it for a reason to talk about this difficult subject. Why would it be difficult for a woman to write about her love? That has to do with the historical context, right? Which is that women did not usually have the right to publish, did not usually publish, and were not thought of as capable of putting into such elegant words their thoughts. They were thought capable of love, but not in expressing it. So she takes a difficult form and tries to talk about the subject of loving someone. Um, that's the other thing. Um, women weren't, it's okay for men to express their love, but for women to do it, it wasn't accepted. So this might be a difficult reason for all of those reasons. Um, um, and then meter. This meter is important because it helps with the flow of ideas. So it will help all of these ideas, da -da, da 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 flowing into each other, moves the poem along to this overall idea that I love you stronger than anything, and this love will last past death, right? The rhyme helps make it more mem memorable. It helps tie idea tie ideas together. Um, and then the enjambment I just talked about, it shifts the focus by forcing the reader to pause at the end of the line where normally it would not. And this enjambment keeps it from being too traditional. So she's taken the sonnet and she's sort of um, taken it. She wants to appropriate it for her own uses to talk about love in a time when women didn't usually do this, but she wants to make it her own. So these are some of the ways it contributes to the meaning. The form contributes to the meaning. Now what about symbols? Here's a second one. I talked about symbols quite a bit in Keats' poetry. And for this particular poem, there weren't a lot of symbols. In fact, all I found really was the sun and candlelight, which you can find on lines, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, line six. They're all in one line. And so again, we like we practiced before, um, you're going to um, name the symbol and then try to figure out what are some other things besides the literal meaning that this might mean. And the sun means power, right? It's powerful. It means it's life-giving, so energy. Um, it also is connected to uh, divinity, right? God. We think of God. That in Christianity, there's also the son of God, S-O-N, but also connected to the power of the S-U-N that lights the entire world. The sun lights the day, the candlelight at night, and then here are some possible connections, right? Those quotes from I got it from gradesaver.com because this is a poem they use to teach even uh, elementary school kids, right? So just as sunlight is essential for living creatures, the speaker's love is critical for her survival, etc. right? Now, I bring this up at the bottom of this slide, the fact that most everything else is not a symbol. This, 
the, even though these words are capitalized, so you might think they might be personified or, I don't know, some other form, the truth is that right in this case, the way she uses it, um, I love thee freely as man's, men strive for right. She means strive for something that's eth ethically correct and just. That's what it literally means. There is no other symbolic meaning here, the way she's using it. Um, same with praise. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. Um, it doesn't mean anything different. So you, in this case, um, if I were to write about symbols in this poem, I really, I could only find one. There may be more, but I could only kind of see these two symbols that mean sort of the same thing. Um, I do think it's significant that she chooses a um, symbol for light that is for the day and the night. I think that's really important. So I think you could write about this if you were to write about, you could write about symbols in this poem for essay two. But there really are very few. You would have to rely on um, an, your other poetic elements to write about. Okay, because, um, okay, sorry. So let me just go back here for a minute or even back even further. So if, in fact, essay two is about writing about what a poem means, make what one clear idea the poem is making, right? my love is stronger than all these other any other force including death and then find poetic elements to help me prove my claim I might use the, the sonnet form why she chose the sonnet what's so important about it how it helps convey this idea and in this case symbols right those two things to help me explain how she creates her meaning okay so that's for essay two but I also wanted to talk about while we're here talking um, about this poem, a little bit about your poetry analysis um, assignment, specifically this area, this is what I'd like us to work on next, is the part of the critical summary. We struggled a little bit with it. Um, well, it wasn't too bad. Some of you were able to find two critics and summarize them pretty easily. Others had less trouble, had more trouble. I would say it's because you need to look at the library refresher that will really help you find critics to summarize. But this time I'd like you to, I'd like to focus on the second part of this, which is to um, apply critical theory to the poem. So this is what I did in my sample, right? I talked about feminism and queer theorists celebrate Sappho, et cetera, et cetera. So I wrote a paragraph and I did not find one other source for it. And the reason is, is because I actually have been highly trained in feminist theory, less so in queer theory, um, mainly as, as it relates to feminist theory. So I don't need to find a source for that, but you all would need to find some kind of source that would help you to do a critical, theor a theoretical reading of a poem. So for your next poetry analysis, I'm going to ask you to really focus on doing a critical uh, theory reading. So the place I, to help you do that, I recommend you go to the critical, the online writing lab at Purdue University. This is a critical theory reference they have, and I'm trying to highlight in these next pages where you would go. So just type in OWL, online writing lab, OWL Purdue, and this is what happened when I did that. The Google search helped, let, led me here. So that's the URL right there. Next, I would click on the part that says Purdue OWL online, online writing lab. There's other things in that menu at the top that you don't need. Then you go to the specific sub, sub, subject specific writing, which will be on the menu on your bottom uh, left hand side. And then I would click on writing in literature and literature literary theory. So that brings us to this page right here. And here is this whole introduction to what literary theory is in general. I would definitely read that. And then it goes into some specific, some specific kind of literary theories. It lists them over here on the left hand side right here of your screen. Um, and over here it tells you a timeline of when they become popular, that kind of thing. So um, I'd like you to look one of those and choose one of those. I, of course, am today going to choose feminist criticism, not because it's just because it's the one I know the best, the one I've had the most practice with, but also because when I read about Elizabeth Barrett Browning in um, preparation for this lecture, 
most people today are still talking about um, her. So I thought, okay, I'll choose that one. So that's here. I would click on my feminist criticism right there, which brings me to this point. All right. It started in the 60s with the women's movement of the 60s and people still do um, feminist critical reading. So if I scroll down, this is what I'm going to see. Feminist theories. What are some of the basic ideas? The six ideas here. So the online writing lab at Purdue did a really good job summarizing these basic ideas. Um, they give us a historical development, but then I want to even further on, they have a bunch of typical questions you ask of the text, any text you're reading. So a lot of these are, it says, um, these questions are for characters in novels or in stories. So maybe that won't work um, for our poetry, but you can still some of these. So here, what constitutes masculinity and femininity? femininity in a poem. Um, how do the different characters, the male speaker or the female speaker, embody traits, etc. So if I were to do Barrett Browning, I would look specifically maybe at, you know, what does this work say about women's creativity? I've already mentioned what critics have, have noted that she was unusual in that she wrote during this time, that she spoke, that she also revived a um, genre that was dead specifically and really impressed all the other male writers. There were very few women in our text period um, that show up and she's one of them that other her con male contemporaries, they celebrated her. They thought she was amazing. So that would be something that would influence the way I read the poem. And then here is, um, let's see, and that's what I was also talking about. What is the history of the work's reception by the public? Tell us about the operation of patriarchy. Look, what it tells us about the operation of patriarchy is that men were fine with accepting some women's work. They thought it was beautiful. Um, that she's expressing her love in kind of this outward way in a time when women were not allowed to. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, but she's an outlier. Other women writing at this time about these things were not allowed to. So... Um, here are some other thoughts about this. This actually, all of this comes from um, my source I list here at the end. Um, Sonnet 43, the article called Sonnet 43 in Poetry for Students, where they just talk about her life, what was going on at, here at the, historically, then the 19th century, people were dis, um, discussing what do we do about women? Should women be allowed to vote? Should women be allowed to participate in all the things that men were able to? And she uh, really fought against some of the restrictions placed upon women and um, did po publish her poetry and became quite famous, right? So here's this first line, Browning, however, resisted. Even as a child, she immersed herself, et cetera, et cetera. So she continued, um, and it tells you some interesting things. I haven't been able to tell you all the things about her really interesting history. For example, how she ends up marrying... Um, another poet um, we have published here, Robert Browning. Um, they are married. Um, when she's older, she has to leave her father's house. She has to kind of escape and do a hidden thing. It's kind of romantic and fun. And everyone thinks that this poem was written, in fact, to her, her husband, um, celebrating that love. So if I were to do a poetry analysis, right, that's what I was getting to um, here in the first place. When I did the section on the critical summary, I would find maybe one critic, but then I would also go here to um, the online, online writing lab and try to understand, choose one of the theories. It doesn't have to be feminism. That's just the one I chose, um, right? One of the theories here, read up about it when you click on it. If you click on feminism, it gives you some ideas about it read that up and then try to just go to the list of questions they have and try to ask that uh, some of those questions, one or two of those questions about the poem itself. Um, make sure you cite the source of this online writing lab, um, the quite where you got the questions and where you got these ideas. Okay. So that is for your poetic analysis, analysis. Um, and then the most uh, immediate assignment for April 7th, 
right, for our April 7th assignment will be for you to um, look at form and symbols in a poem, one of the poems that I have listed here in the assignment. Um, that will be due on April 7th.